demonstration by uh, showing you one of the special features of Notion. This is called our In Tempo. In Tempo allows me to actually conduct the playback of the music. And I do this by tapping the rhythm. The rhythm you can see at the very top of the score. It's notated, and it's notated in such a way as to control the different musical events that are taking place that would coincide with that actual rhythm. Uh, I can change tempo from note to note, and therefore I can work with live musicians and give them the freedom that they would need to interpret, and particularly with a song like this, which is full of all kinds of rubato. So Liz Harvey is going to sing Musetta's waltz song from uh, from La Boheme by Puccini. Okay, here we go. is a totally integrated product which combines notation with the orchestral playback of a notated score. And it really consists of three components, one being the notation interface, which you'll see, you're seeing here, which I will demonstrate in a minute. Uh, it, and it also has a very powerful uh, sampling playback mechanism which is uh, able to control as many as a thousand or more notes at uh, any given moment. Uh, it's an extremely powerful uh, engine. And it has a full complement of orchestral sounds recorded by the principal players of the London Symphony Orchestra, recorded in the Abbey Road Studios in London. We see it as a professional tool for composers and arrangers and educators and performers and also as an optimum learning environment for music students at all levels because it provides the feedback from the notation from the sound and uh, allows people to experiment and whatever trial by error but it, you, this is a very good way to learn so we have um, all of that uh, to give you an idea of how the program works as far as the notation is concerned 
Uh, if you want to build a score, you can select a template to begin with, or you can simply put together your own score. I, I'm going to select, let's say, violins, viola, cello, and bass. I'll put in another violin section, and here's my score uh, for a string orchestra. Now, the first thing I'm going to be doing is putting in normal notational marks. It asks for a time signature. I can go over here. I can select a number of different common signatures or I can say other and I can come down to this properties box and edit and it becomes my cursor. I bring the cursor back into the score, click the mouse and there we are. If I want a key signature I come back up here and select key signatures uh, let's say D major bingo there it is in the score you'll notice that all of the items over here on this sidebar are no more than one level deep so when I bring this back up let's say I want to look at clefs there they are if I want uh, repeats there's all kinds of repeats and so forth down here I have articulations I have ornaments I also I uh, have tempo markings. Let's pick one of those. Let's say Allegro. I can now edit what the tempo would be. Quarter note equals, let's say, 100 instead of 112. I bring that over here. It's my cursor. I'm going to plop it into the score by clicking, just, just like the other things. Now, I can get notes over here. I can say there's a quarter note. But much simpler is to use the keyboard shortcuts, which are very, very easy to remember. Uh, Q equals quarter note. If I hit Q twice, I get quarter rest. So I'm toggling between note and rest. E for eighth note, same deal. S gives me sixteenths. T gives me twenty seconds, or thirty seconds. Uh, H for half note, W for whole note. Now you'll notice that all of these note names are right under the left hand on the keyboard so it's very convenient to have my hand on the keyboard left hand and right hand controlling the mouse determining where the notes are so let's say I put in here and a quarter note a couple of eighth notes maybe a couple more eighth notes some sixteenth notes and I'm gonna put another note in and finally another note and this one you'll notice turns red why because it's telling me that there's more notes in this bar than the signature calls for so i'm going to take that one out and put a bar line in i do this by hitting the i key which looks like a bar line uh, if i want a sharp i go up to the three key because it looks like a sharp so in other words it's really easy to remember what these keys are uh, and now at any moment we can actually play this now suppose I want that somewhat more legato uh, what I do is I put in a slur we can put it all the way across and we get we get a more slurred sound if I don't want that if let's say I want all of these notes to be staccato I can actually choose it as a group and say, let's add staccato. And now I have a bunch of staccatos. And we're actually going to a recorded staccato sound from the string section. Let's say we want an accent here. Well, let's put a staccato accent maybe on these two notes. Let's put just a regular uh, accent here. On my F key, I have a bunch of forte type symbols. So I can now say, let's start forte. I'm going to pull up a crescendo mark, take it all the way over to here. Uh, we'll put another note in in the next bar. And we'll say we're going to crescendo all the way up to three Fs. We're going to decrescendo down to, say, mezzo piano. So it's, it's, it's basically it's doing all of these marks that I'm putting into the score. Let's call this mezzo forte instead and let's put in a trail. Okay. We 
you've got a trail. So, you, under, you get the point. And by the way, this is a string section, so let's try something a little different. Let's tell it if we're going to pizzicato, <laughs> and we're going to, I've got my symbols a little too, uh, too large here, and I can control that, but I'm not going to bother right now. Uh, then we're going to get this. And back to the, to the trail again. So that gives you an idea. All the editing for the playback is done with conventional notational symbols. There's no bothering with things like patches, uh, patch numbers, uh, any kind of tweaking behind the scenes. And um, which means that once you've taken a score and edited it to make it sound exactly the way you want, you can then extract the parts, print them out, give them to a live orchestra and expect that that orchestra will know what to do. And in fact, uh, I've had the experience now of doing just this very thing. And it, the orchestra knows what these marks mean. So it's exactly the same thing. So you see what I mean when I say it's both a learning experience and a professional tool. The program also will send the uh, playback information directly to disk as a WAV file. So the program can generate its own WAV files. You can also, um, and let me pull up a, another score here to show you this. Let's say I want to hear only, go back to the top of this. Let's say I want to hear the second violins alone. I can simply isolate them and tell them to play. So I can proofread my score a part at a time I could also, if I wanted to get into some high-tech things with this program, I could have the program record each separate instrument as a separate WAV file. And then I could call those files up into a program like Pro Tools or Vegas and have them, they would automatically be synchronized so you could then do any kind of extra editing and so forth. However, I will say this, we're not using any plugins, we're not using reverb. What you're hearing is the actual ambience that was recorded in the, uh, in the Abbey Road studios. And that means that after the tone, after a, a note stopped sounding, there was an echo in the hall, which we recorded. Now, when we play a note, we go to that same echo at the end of that note, so we're getting the actual ambience in the hall. However, if I want to change that, I can actually control the amount of decay that's attached to each note. So I can pull this all the way down to zero and tell the score to play, and I'm going to hear a very dry performance. Now if I go back to my uh, mixer here and say let's pull that all the way up to 100, and play the same thing. So you get the idea that uh, this can be controlled separately per instrument. Each instrument can be actually given its own amount of, of this uh, reverb and so forth, so that you actually have a great deal of control. Also, you can pan the instruments right and left wherever you want. Uh, just to give you an idea of the power of the, uh, let me go back and find this file, the power of the, um, the playback driver, I've got a piece here that was written by one of our own staff, and in it, he asked the cellos to play a chromatic run. Now, this chromatic run includes all the quarter tones in between the half steps, so, which the score, by the way, which we support in the score. Now, we also have a pedal mark down here. Now, most cellos don't have a pedal, but we do. So when we put that pedal on, all of these notes sustain there are about a hundred of them. By the end of this bar, you're hearing all hundred notes. They're all crescendoing. Immediately after that, 
There's a series of clusters here in uh, the uh, keyboard instruments with lots and lots of notes, as you can see. Now, the program is able to look ahead, see what's coming up, load the sounds it needs into memory in advance, put together chords like this in such a way that they all, all the notes sound immediately as one sound rather than one at a time. This is because we're not using MIDI uh, as our internal driver. We have our own code, uh, which is much more powerful. So I'll play these, I'll play these bars for you. Here comes the cello. Tried this stuff. And you notice that while it's doing all of that, I'm able to scroll the screen around, move the cursor, and do all these kinds of things. So what, what that means is that we have a very efficient system, and uh, we're using the CPU and the memory, handling it very well. All this coming, by the way, from a laptop, and the sound is coming directly from the internal sound card of the laptop. We're not using any special equipment externally. When you buy the program, this is what you get. You get all of this in, in one. Uh, it takes about three gigs off of your hard drive because of the samples. They take up about that much space. We recommend a uh, minimum of 512 uh, mega uh, of, of uh, RAM memory and a CPU that runs at least uh, a gig and a half hertz. Uh, other than that, there's no particular requirements and uh, the, the program should work just fine. The files that are made from this, the file that generates this, uh, what you see on the screen, is relatively small. It's really a file that contains the notation information, not the playback, not the music itself. Those files are about on the order of something like a Microsoft Word file or something like that, which means they're much smaller than an MP3 or a, a WAV file. You can send them through the mail. Now, if another person has this same program on the other side of the continent and receives this same file in the mail, he plugs it in, he's going to hear exactly the same thing. All the same sounds, everything. So it's not, it's not necessary to pass information in the musical form. We can do it as document files. The program, uh, in addition to what I've showed you in the way of note entry and so forth, the program reads XML files, so it can import files from uh, Sibelius and Finale. It can import files from scanning programs that will create XML. And we have uh, MIDI input, several types of MIDI input from keyboard, which you can actually see demonstrated out in our stations outside here. So that's an overview of the program.